Well, and talking about decisions, um, what, uh, who do you think I should ask next? Who do you think I should uh, invite? Yeah, and full disclosure, she's a very good friend of mine as well. Uh, her name is Nyari Samashonga. She's based in Johannesburg, uh, Zimbabwe. I think this is her. It is, it is. Uh, I didn't show the pictures before in our pre-talk, so it's it's always a <laughs> risk to show these kind no, of pictures. Is. And then... It is. Uh, she's uh, the CEO of We Think Code, the software development academy that I that I help out with. Uh, she's spoken at a few events and conferences uh, in Europe as well. Um, what I do appreciate about her is her not being a technologist by starting out in a career, but more often uh, on the accounting and economic side and audit side and then moving into accounting. So having conversations with her about agile software development, uh, how uh, teams build software, having never started there in her life uh, mm. and being there accidentally uh, is, is an incredible conversation. She brings a perspective that I've, I've learned a lot from, uh, talks a lot about leadership and uh, how to get teams moving and how to how to build organizations in a sustainable way. So, yeah, sounds, I think sounds interesting. Enjoy, you'll yeah. enjoy talking to her. Yes, just the explanation already sounds sounds to me like okay, this is yet another person I want to meet and and have it. Um... Today, I'm talking with Nyari Shamushunga. We talked about how being the daughter of a single mother formed her in ways she only saw later in life, about different versions of people being mean to her and the words she now knows for these versions, about talking a lot about something she thought she did not want to do. I'm Yves Hanul from Who's Agile. My pronouns are he and him. Welcome to my channel. You see a lot of Agilists around me on this screen. If you want to hear me interviewing, please click that subscribe button because these are the people that I've invited so far. If you think I'm missing people, let me know in the comments. And that like button, well, if you liked today's interview, don't forget to click it. Hello and hello everyone. And with me, I have Nyari. Um, and Nyari, uh, if, uh, well, for the people who are, who are here, one of the things I, I always like to start with is, is where are we? And, and for me, and let's, let's show this a little bit. I am in, oh, it's not even showing. Let's, uh, let's ask Google where I am. So that should bring me back to, to Belgium, somewhere where I am in, in Ghent. And then we go from here uh, immediately to Johannesburg, where uh, Nyari is. And that uh, shows us a little bit on where you are. Um, and from my side, it's uh, 20 before 6. And uh, what, uh, what's the time on, on your side? 20 before 7. So we're an hour apart. So quite close. Yeah, quite close. And that's that's also always one of the nice things. We're a lot of time zones, uh, well, uh, not much time zones away, but a lot of miles away, but not so much time zones, just one mile, uh, one hour away. And, and yeah, that's, of course, how the world works these days. Uh, but recording it um, online and Nyari, well, we jumped right into it. But uh, tell us a little more. Who are you and what do you want people to know about you? Well, I am a Zimbabwean, born and raised, but now, so just slightly north of the map um, is where I was born and raised, and I now reside in South Africa. I am an accountant who pivoted in life and became a technologist, and wow. the passion of my life currently is building people that build technology. So I'm in education, I've shifted out of consulting, and now see myself mostly as an educator, and that's how I would summarize my journey. Wow. And so you moved from Zambia to, to South Africa. Is there anything specific? What made you move, made you do that move? I moved from Zimbabwe uh, to uh, South Africa. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I moved from Zimbabwe to South Africa. Um, essentially, I think at the time that I left Zimbabwe, I was looking for more economic opportunity. The economy in Zimbabwe was taking a lot of strain because of the political situation. Um, mm. And I wanted to learn more. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to travel. So uh, when is 2007? It's almost 16 years ago I left Zimbabwe, lived in the United States in New York for about five years, then lived in Tanzania for about half a year, and then now I'm living in South Africa. 
and I have been doing since uh, 2012. So it's almost just over a decade now um, that I've lived in South Africa. So yeah, I've hopped around a little bit. Yeah, it's, 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 and well, not just a little bit, it's, it's multiple <laughs> continents already. So that's that's uh, more than, than I did and, and that most people do, I would say. So uh, when, when you started out saying, I, I, I wanted to see the world, I thought, okay, it's not that far. But then you ended up to say, oh, well, wait a minute, I first went to the United States. So that's a, that's a big cultural shift, I can imagine. So that's uh, a big difference. Huge. And I left Zimbabwe in the Zimbabwean summer. Um, and the first stop in the United States was Salt Lake City <laughs> in winter. So I went from one of the hottest climates to um, snow everywhere. And that was an adjustment, um, not to layer on food and, you know, just general culture, but also really enriching. I think you 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 become a slightly different person when you see more, you embrace people differently and I've, I've enjoyed that i've appreciated that a lot and and when you say winter for example is that i have no idea is, did you did you know snow snow before you you moved uh, I, I have no idea how how it is in uh, in your your country of origin did you have oh, any snow it has no snow um if uh, if we get down to about four degrees celsius in zimbabwe it is a an exceptionally cold. cold day <laughs> and so even in our winter in the middle of the day the sun will be shining bright and you'll get to like 20 degrees celsius and so that was a it was a it was the first shock <laughs> but you know you you take it in stride i did go skiing skiing spent most of my time skiing mostly on my butt because i kept falling but i enjoyed it thoroughly <laughs> <laughs> i enjoyed it thoroughly so um, I guess an adventurer at heart, and uh, yeah, that's 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 where I've been. Yeah, it, 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 that's why I'm asking because I can imagine if if winter is like 20 degrees and you come back to a country where it's snowing, it's uh, it's very cold. That's uh, especially if it's you, you didn't even have the time to adjust because you moved from from very hot to very uh, cold almost in in the day. I would say well. The, except for the plane maybe but uh between that there was uh, that that i can imagine that it's a, a big adjustment uh, when when you started uh, immediately with that i mean absolutely the clothes you wear when you put on <laughs> when you get on the plane are not at all suitable when you get off the plane on the other side but i guess it's it's, it's an interesting one because we're having a conversation about agile and um since then i think i do believe sometimes in just taking the plunge you know Yes, there are times for increments, but there are also sometimes for just like taking a big leap and experiencing that and then figuring out what you need to do to adapt. So you put some basic measures on the outside so that um, the shock is not an existential crisis. But every once in a while, it's nice to shake things up a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, but did you? Well, you you talk. It's it's very interesting that you say about the clothes, for example. Did you did you think about that up front? Did you knew that it was going to be colder, and 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 so you, did you try to adjust, or did you try to yeah, I don't know, have other clothes and with you or something? Absolutely. I mean, I I knew it was going to be cold. I when I travel on holiday within the country, I check weather. I'm one of those people who mm -hmm. prepares in that way. So I knew it was going to be much colder. I did have a big jacket, but then I still had a lot to learn about the layering of it. So it's one thing to understand cold and to understand a big coat for outside. But then in Zimbabwe, because our climate is so warm, um, we generally don't have great insulation in the homes because the temperature range mm. is very mild. Um, whereas when you're living in a place that's very, very cold, while it's freezing cold outside, the heating and everything inside is a different way. So we're in Zimbabwe on a winter day, I would probably be dressed heavier um, than what I would dress when I'm in the you know, US on a cold day yeah. under my coat. And so I had to learn that about the, the layering for the cold and how to deal with things and the car and scraping snow off the windshield and all, all these. <laughs> so there's an intellectual understanding of the construct and what your body should expect. And then there's the practical little things that actually make that adaptation complete. And so, yeah, it was, it was an adventure and I enjoyed it. Yeah, that that's why I was asking because you can you can imagine that it will going to be colder and then you're there and all of a sudden you really think oh that's what cold is. Uh, 
<laughs> it's, yeah, it's because you think that you know the difference because yeah there is some difference in temperature in your home country but that's completely you cannot really prepare for it uh, I, I think that's uh, that's that's interesting so we jumped right into that already that uh, i love it that's 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 how we get to know a little bit uh, for, uh, about you so but let's uh, jump into that uh, first question what is something that people usually don't know about you but has influenced you in in who you are i think the one that i would say is that i'm the daughter of a single mother and mm. um i come from an environment that's very patriarchal and the roles are very women do this and men do this and it's one of those things that you realize its impact in hindsight that when you grow up in a home raised by a single mother um your framework as a woman is not as constrained by the role play because the roles were not enacted in the home and i think that's something that people um probably don't know about me but what it's created in me is this sense of boundlessness is that mm. i show up as whoever i am and as whoever i am um i'm going to give it a shot and so this idea that because i came from here i should end up here because i look like this i should do it that way because i heard it there it's true over there is a construct that in hindsight i think growing up with a single mom who raised her kids and my brother was as responsible for the yard as he was for the kitchen and the same for me and i didn't have all these constructs of women do this and they play these roles freed me um initially and i think it was later in life that i realized that oh women shouldn't be here and you shouldn't be speaking there and you shouldn't be doing that and i'm like oh <laughs> sorry i was you mother did it all because your mother did it all but she she had yeah, no choice and so i wasn't even trying to be activist initially i was literally just being myself and then as i started to face that resistance encountered the reality that oh this is a very progressive position to hold and had to work backwards and educate myself on that context um so that i could understand other people better but that's something that has been incredibly influential i think for me in terms of how i grew up um that people don't probably realize the extent to which it anchored me as an independent thinker who's just going to blaze her own trail it's interesting because typically when people talk about single parenthood they they always say it in in a kind of negative way oh then you you miss kind of role models and you miss a father role and, and whatever but you you basically say it's for me it was the opposite i because of that i didn't have any boundaries i didn't see oh this is a mother role this is a father role because your mother did it all and uh, uh, just by by curiosity do you have any idea if if that was the same thing for your brother did he see something similar or or don't you know i think so i think well my i started to realize the extent to which he felt he's older than me um mm -hmm. a responsibility to play maybe a bit of a father role and to show up demonstrative um but he and i were actually really really close and interestingly because we were close and we were peers he probably exposed me to a lot of things that were boy things <laughs> that again mm -hmm. i didn't realize that these are for boys i was just playing with my big brother um but i think for him especially as we got older he felt a need to create structure and all of that around me but his comfort around strong women is something that i definitely think for him highly normalized from a very early age from my mother being strong and having these strong women around her be the her mother her friends and it just modeled the construct of strength beat emotive strength or practical physical strength like fixing things around the house going up into the ceiling to change a bulb like all of those things were just it's what you did if you needed to do it and i think that's how it should be but i think um i was privileged to not be socialized any differently when i was young and so like i said it was a, a very late in my life before i realized that oh it's not normal that you just react to this event in this way this is your place and it's a you know it's a little bit activist to step up and take it on especially in the culture that i grew up in and so um i think the contradiction for my brother is a little bit more complex than mine um but ultimately his sense of what a woman's place is is i think very much informed by how we were raised as you know whoever's the best person to do it should do it and it's not a, a gender assigned responsibility 
And and that 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 didn't give you any problems in school, for example, because what I'm hearing is that you only learned, or that hey, that that might be a problem later in life. So I assume after you left school, when you started working, or or some years later. Uh, so so yeah, it it was kind of natural in your upbringing. Uh, that that's what I'm hearing. So that's, you know, it, uh, it, if I'm honest, when I look back, I suspect that. It probably gave me problems in school, but I didn't know to assign it to gender. <laughs> it's a similar experience um, with being black. When you grow up in Africa and in Zimbabwe, specifically for me, you're the majority race, and so blackness in Zimbabwe in the time I grew up there was a non-issue until I got to the United States. And again, so things probably happen, um, but it takes a while for the consciousness to register it. As that because you haven't grown up expecting that strife to be triggered by that attribute and so when the strife comes there you just kind of approach it like i think you're being unreasonable <laughs> and then you later on realize that oh i'm the only girl in the room i'm the only black person in the room i'm an immigrant in the room so all of these identities that you know carry a certain importance it's an importance i i discovered slowly <laughs> because in my mind i was just nyari doing whatever nyari was busy doing and someone was either being nice or mean and then later you discover that that particular brand of mean is because you're a woman and it's called sexism and that particular brand of mean is because you're black and it's called racism and it's an important education but i i'm just describing the manner in which i came into that education is my mom was just like Go out, be nyari, be fierce, be silly. Hope you get some things right. Become independent, and so here I am now. So well, and and it's never good to to encounter racism and sexism. But if you had to encounter, it's better to encounter them later when you're already an adult, and then you can kind of understand it. It still is silly. It still is stupid. But still, you if if you if you're uh, a young girl, then it would be completely impossible to to understand it. Usually, because most children they just treat each other as as normal, except if they are taught by by adults uh, about some of that stuff. But you were lucky to. to to grow up in in a world where that that didn't take place uh, and in a sense partially because you indeed you were part of the majority in in your country of course so that's uh, that's one part that that helped in that so that's uh, that's indeed something that's influenced and it's it's very nice that you stated because a lot of white people that might like me might not realize it because we're in the majority and it's only when you move to another country or you when you're uh, in an environment where you're no longer the majority that you might realize oh that does it, it it, it's like that when when yeah you don't no longer get things automatically and and that is why it, I, I I think it's easy for me but maybe it's easy because I'm in the majority and I have so much privilege and then we don't realize it um, and for one of the reasons why it's really good to go to other countries and to meet other cultures and to understand mm. that hey for a, a lot of uh, English speaking people cannot even realize that English is not even the, the most spoken language I, I, I don't know it's not even the, the second or the third spoken language so in the world but most people speak english when they start to, to work with people from us or U uk and then somehow a lot of us think that that english is the most spoken language but it's not uh, and yeah most of us we cannot realize it it's uh, it's interesting so that's a that's indeed something that i can imagine that is that's really influential so thank you for sharing because it's it's yeah, it, it, it's it's a very powerful message. So I want to move to that uh, second question: that if you had not been doing what you've been doing now, do you have any idea what uh, would have become of you? I think I would have been an accountant, to be honest, and I think I would have been um, probably more in business as an executive because I think I'm a builder by nature. Um, I'm a person who looks at a scenario and sees what opportunity is there and then gets busy essentially trying to improve or build on it. That's my nature. And so I think if I hadn't been doing that as an educator, which is predominantly what I do now, I probably would have been doing it with business um, because similarly, I see interesting opportunity on how to do things differently. I think the strand of equity and impact would always follow through my work, um, but I think I probably would have been doing it more in a corporate frame than in an education one. 
And like you said, in the, that that is how you started out your your career, one way or another. If if I'm understanding mm -hmm. correctly, what made you move out of that career to what to the educational part? Is there anything particular that made you do that that switch? So I think if you had met me when I was in my corporate career, I would have told you if I wasn't doing this, I would have been a teacher. <laughs> and then, um, so I think what made me move was when I switched from finance into tech, it was an interesting journey. I wasn't feeling fulfilled. Um, and in, a, in finance, I predominantly was working in audit, which was like a regulatory role. Some other people come mm -hmm. with great ideas and they do something. And my job is to come and review what they did and give a point of view. Um, but I wanted to be part of creating. I wanted to be part of either a blank canvas and bringing something to life or a messy canvas and trying to create some order in it. And I felt like I was, you know, always showing up at the after party and wondering what the you know, real party had been. And so that's what shifted me initially from accounting into tech. But then within tech, um, started out essentially, you know, part of build teams and then went into more the business leadership aspect of technology um, in a consultancy and then later in my own business. Um, but always in all I did, whether I was working in accounting or I was working in tech, I was always either volunteering my time to teach um, or directing what budget I had available to you know, organizations that were teaching in particular this idea around equity, reaching people that through some structural barrier don't get to access certain knowledge. And um, I grew up in a Zimbabwe where the public education system was very strong. I know since then it suffered some setbacks, but the implication of that was that um, regardless of what your family financial background was, you had a pretty good opportunity of a good education. And with that good education, you had a pretty good opportunity of upward mobility. And I think even before I could articulate that, that principle stuck with me. So when I was working more on the corporate side, be that in finance or in technology, my investment in, well, how do I make sure that to the extent that I can contribute barriers to accessing education, which I always saw as a gateway to self-actualization, could be lowered? And so when I was now... Um, Wait, wait, can I can I go a little bit into that? Because what I'm hearing is that it, it's it, I kind of translated to kind of paying it forward because you, you had the chance to get that good education uh, in your home country and you want to give it back to the people who are now in that need. Is, is that correct? Definitely. And just this sense of there's more to life, you know, there's more to life than balance sheets and profit and loss statements. And what is that more is all this. Um, I could open up access to this. So it's part paying it forward, but also I feel like just part the, the construct of access, which is if I can enable someone to have access to even have more than you know what I had is something that's important to me. It's just like a, a world where you know people have opportunity. They have opportunity to try. When they make a mistake, it's not like the end of the world because you know your mother is not rich and wealthy and can't come and clean up after you then your world is confined to the one mistake. You, you know, you had a baby young, you failed out of your high school examination, whatever the case might be. There are these things that I think are normal aspects of life, but that when you come from a low income environment are so punitive. Yeah. And so this construct to me has never really made sense. And it's always been about, oh, if you can get in there, keep that door open because there's someone on the other side who, you know, kept that door open for you because these structures were already there when you were, you know, on the wrong side of the door and now you've made it through, you understand the struggle to come in. So similarly, as a matter of principle, I think it's appropriate that everyone should have that access. And so, you know, I would moonlight, I would volunteer, I would mentor, I would do what I could, but it was never my full-time um, responsibility. And when I was now um, working with some co-partners in my own business, I was approached by We Think Code, which is the organization I work for now, because they were looking for a CEO and they asked me if I would consider taking on the role. And initially when I went, I loved the idea and like I loved the work they were doing, but I was very much entrenched in all. You know, I work for myself now, I control my hours, I control my income, I pick my clients. And so I'm in a pretty comfortable, cushy place. But let me help you find someone because I love what you're doing. And months in, I couldn't help them find someone. And this thing just stuck with me. And I realized it was an opportunity to formally participate in something that I had always cared about, but always done in my free time. 
Um, and I was like, well, maybe give it a shot. Give it a couple of years. Go in and be fully immersed and see where it leads. And um, it's been four years now and I'm, I'm loving it. And it's led me different ways. And in some ways, it's what I expected. In most ways, not at all. Um, but ultimately, it's quite fulfilling. It's interesting that you basically they reached out to you and and you kind of rejected it in in a way and it, so it took you how long did it take you to realize that this could be actually an opportunity for you was that maybe, very quick or maybe about two three months like even as I was going through wow. the interview process I think internally I was still wrestling with it like is this really something that I could do um, could I enjoy myself there and there was also the the, the institutional aspect of going from when you work in your own business, the amount of control and autonomy you have to regardless of what the role is, going into an institution that in many ways belongs to other people and they've got all the say, am I ready to go into the the politics, as it were, of an organization again when I've enjoyed working with a few friends running a boutique consulting firm? Um, yes, there's politics everywhere, but the levels of it were really low and in part because we had the ability to just say, no, nope, we don't touch that. No, nope, we don't do that. No, we don't need that. And now suddenly the, the sincerity of it is if you're working in an organization with a lot more people, the social complexity increases. And if you sign up for that, you're essentially, if you've got any integrity, committing to work through that social complexity. And part of me wasn't sure if I, <laughs> I wanted that for myself. And so it was a, a wrestling for maybe about three, four months um, to say, is this right for me? And can I do it justice? Because if I sign up, then I sign up, but I, I can't half sign up. And so, yeah. And then at some point I sat down with my sister and she was quite insistent that, well, for something you don't want to do, we talk about it an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice mirror to get, uh, to, to have to really say that, okay, it's uh, it's interesting, but that, that's why I was asking because because I can imagine if you're well, I'm I'm independent as well, and and I see a lot of people in that situation struggling. What what is it? You build something on your own. You I, I like my own freedom, and I like collaborating. I like to work together with with uh, with companies. And sometimes, indeed, something comes along and say like, is this the right moment? Is this the right thing to do? But what I'm hearing is that for you, that um, yeah, there was so much. Well, I, I hear already so much other stuff around that that it looks like a, a, a natural uh, thing for you to do. I, I really like, I want to go back a little bit, I really like what you said about opening that door because a lot of us, we don't understand the privilege that you have. But like you say, if you are in a less privileged situation and you get in, you realize it's much more. And and yeah, I see this a lot with, with people who were able to get in, that they care a lot more about the people that are left out. And, and like you say, uh, a lot of privileged people, they don't understand how lucky we are because indeed, if, if something happens, uh, well, there is always some kind of safety net. But if you're on the other side, just a very small thing that could happen and and you don't you don't get any chance anymore and and that could be nice things like indeed like you said getting a baby that's that's partly nice but at the same time it it takes you out of a, a possible study or or job or whatever because it's yeah it, it's not uh it, it's not the right moment in life for for getting in inside the door for for other opportunities and that's i really like that you you point that out and that you try to make sure that you you help out people to to get in the door i think that's uh that's wonderful and uh this brings me kind of automatically to that uh to that next question because i feel a lot of passion i feel a lot of drive here so do you have any idea where that original passion or that drive is is coming from so it's an interesting one. I always feel like the drive question is a chicken and egg question. Um, mm -hmm. Is Are people driven? And then in whatever scenario they show up in, the drive presents because that is their personality. And I've definitely, you know, met those like very motivated personalities where almost very competitive, whatever we're doing, they show up competitive. But to the chicken and egg question, or is it that if you immerse yourself in particular environments, invariably a passion attaches to what that is. And I think with me, it's definitely, especially as I get older, the sense of purpose is so important. Um, I recently turned 40. Um, when I look at 
when I was young and I was in my early 20s, I was driven by this need to create a financial safety net, to build a career, to be able to contribute to my family because I didn't come from much. Um, and then as I moved into my 30s and so forth, I was driven by, okay, um, I'm working in this place. This is when I made my switch from accounting into tech. I've picked this change. How do I learn enough about this and then bring what I learned before? So I think I was looking for a bit more of like a consolidation of knowledge and, okay, what do I want to be? Maybe I might grow up one day. What do I want to be? But then now mm. that I've turned 40, I think for me, I'm more purpose-driven. I want to sign up and be in places where I value what's going on there. You know, so I'm not going to go drinking just to be with friends, which is what I would do before. I'll be with friends and then I'll have a drink. So it's kind of this life stage transition. So now I'm driven by purpose. I involve myself in things that I see meaning in. And I don't want to like be highfalutin and pontificating when I talk about um, I see meaning. Sometimes the meaning is really small. Like uh, I've recently taken up gardening. And I find it very soothing to be in the garden, whether I'm weeding or I'm, you know, deadheading my roses. I, I find such enjoyment and pleasure in that. And I'm driven to do it really well. And you see my garden start to flourish because the purpose I find in that is an opportunity to come back into myself and to be still. Whereas mm. if you see my drive at We Think Code, it's this passion for these young people that I represent, where I feel like, well, these are young people, they're smart people, they're competent people, and the world has written a narrative about them because of where they come from that has nothing to do with who they are, given how they show up. So my drive is this responsibility to tell that story and carry that torch truthfully, very different from my gardening experience. And then I work out a lot, and that's about like you know mental health a little bit and just physically, as I get older, trying to keep my body mobile and active, and my drive there is maybe a bit more of a tension with myself. I'd rather be in bed than running an extra kilometer. I'd rather be sleeping than lifting another dumbbell. But there's a different thing there. So I think for me, I'm purpose first. I need a why. And then once I have a why, I can show up. And whether I'm enjoying it that day or I'm flat or I'm really not enjoying it, the why gets me out of bed. The why keeps me honest. The why makes me be disciplined, quite simply. So it's not just like a passion project. It's a purpose project. And so I think that's what drives me. I, I want to go a little bit back when, when you said when you were younger, um, you, you talked also about, well, it was about money and, and creating a safety net. Is the fact that you have a safety net also did that create the opportunity to go for purpose? Because I can imagine if you if you have to struggle for life, it, it doesn't matter about purpose. You just want to survive. And so is is that part of that, how you could make that transition? Or is that just purely, like you said, age-based? No, absolutely. And I think I felt the, the, the moment of shift. An example is when my, my mm. younger sister was in university. And as a family, we were contributing to my younger sister's university. And when we paid the last payment for her last year of varsity, by then I had already started to feel like, oh, accounting might be a little bit frustrating, but literally any effort or passion or energy to do it left my body. And why? Because that was the last kind of step. It was a financial responsibility and a financial net when you have a dependent is very different when it's just you. When you have a dependent, you're not just making choices for yourself you're making choices for someone else's well-being. And I think you decide a little bit differently. I definitely see it with friends of mine that are parents. When it's just you, whatever trade-off you make, you wake up with the good or the bad consequence and you, you don't have to look at someone else and feel like, oh, I put you in that position. And so fighting for financial independence and stability was freeing because then suddenly, you know, decisions about what I want to do, places where I want to work, I've taken so many pay cuts after that moment because now it's like, well, actually, this is all I need. It's enough. And this other stress and madness you're bringing into my life, I don't need. And especially for that extra penny, not worth it. I'm going to cut back on this expense and I'm going to go do that and dip into my savings a little bit and have a good night's sleep. And whereas when you don't have financial stability, 
you, you, you won't have a good night's sleep in some instances. And it takes, I think, a lot more courage to say no, because I think people stronger than I say no, even in financially precarious positions. I think I didn't have that courage. And so it was important for me to build a bedrock of financial stability and then wake up and use it as a weapon for choice. What do I want? But, but, but if did I hear also correctly is that that you partially also paid for the education of, of your sister. So in a right. sense, there was already a purpose even back then, although the purpose was not you, but the purpose was also kind of a little bit like what you do now. Now you help others and, and, and with, with with your current organization but at that time you were helping your sister and paying her education it was not by your work but it was with your money in a way and in that sense also by your work is is that correctly absolutely and when that purpose moved away i reevaluated the setup and it didn't make sense anymore um because i didn't need that paycheck at that level i could get a smaller paycheck and You know, and I, I know that as a finance person, that doesn't make sense because then essentially what one would argue is that um, a cost fell off and I had more surplus and so I should stay in that seat and now enjoy the surplus. But I think I'm a little bit differently wired. Suddenly it was like, oh, I can own my time differently and I can own my life journey differently because my financial responsibilities have diminished. And I can go out tomorrow and buy a big house and start paying it off, or I can now just reduce my income and do what I really want to do. And, and that's the road that I, I took and found a different and that, Yeah, and what I'm hearing is that at that time, maybe especially at the end, you might not have liked your job anymore because you felt kind of constrained. And then no extra money is, is going to help you. It will just make you feel burnout or, or whatever, but definitely not going to make you happiness. And well, uh, for me, th these times, the time is really the, the real currency that we pay. Uh, I mean, uh, having mm -hmm. a lot of millions uh, on your bank account doesn't help you if you if you if you're stuck in, in, in a life that you don't like. And let's face it, uh, eight hours at work, if we don't like to doing the work, that's a lot of time. That is if it's not likely. <laughs> and you know how it is, like even with a dinner party with people you don't want to be around, the energy you need to get through that same one hour is amplified. You, you know, you were talking to me about one of the podcasts you've done in the past, which went on for three hours and you didn't see the time go by. And yet I'm exactly. sure you've had conversations for five minutes where you're like, was that an hour? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's mostly because of what it takes out of you. The one was feeding you and the other one was like requiring all your good manners. And, you know, I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to. And so I think it's a similar thing with me in my life is that I'm very, to your description, very aware of how I'm feeling in, a, in an environment. And when I'm unhappy, I'm not impulsive. I won't storm out. But there is an analysis that goes on about why I'm unhappy and what I'm seeking and what a journey is to get to a, a place of better balance, you know, because also ups and downs in life are part of the whole game. But then there are downs that, you know, like you don't like. And then also as I get older, there are ups that are like vertigo and you're like, yeah. It's a bit exciting in here, but I don't understand it. I don't, I'd rather be sitting at home looking at my garden quietly than with all this hullabaloo. So I think I've always been a very introspective person. I'm an introvert by nature and I'm very introspective. And so to your point, time is finite. Everything else you can try and multiply this way. You can add that way. You can tinker with that 24 hours in the day. That's the 24 hours and how you use them. It's spent. They're not coming back. And I am very sensitive to that. Thank you for, for sharing, because that's indeed very important in, in these days and age that people realize that. And uh, I recognize a lot of what you say. I'm, I'm uh, a lot older than, than you are, uh, and I'm in my 50s already, but, but I have similar kind of ways of thinking, probably around the same time when I was uh, at the end of my 30s, uh, beginning early 40s. I felt similar kind of things like, okay, what do I really want to do and where is the time I want to spend and, and thinking about that. And yeah. And like you say, of course we, we, we think differently when we're 20, then uh, that, that that's also part of life, but it's, it's good to, to also share it for, for the people who are somewhere, because I can imagine, well, I've, I know that uh, I had conversations with people in the beginning 40 that were doubting some of that. Why is that? Why don't I enjoy this or that anymore? Well, 
priorities are shifting and, and things are, are changing a little bit so that's uh, that's that's i think is rather okay and as long as like you say you think about it and you do it consciously it's it, it, it's fine uh you you don't want to live the full life uh, like you're in your 20s because it we i I'm, I'm sure our bodies would not be able to do that that's for sure uh but also it's it's less interesting we learn other stuff so there is other interesting things uh, I want to move to that next question. That is, um, what do you consider your biggest achievement? So basically, this is your moment to brag. And I have no idea how easy it is for you to brag. Do you come from a culture where it's normal to brag or is it hard for you to do that? It's, it's very hard for me to brag. Mm. Um, I think my biggest achievement is definitely building Rethink Code into what it is today. Um, I joined the organization. It was half the size. Uh, in terms of its annual recruitment of students, it was less than half the size in terms of the staff. Uh, so we were recruiting 220 students a year. Now we're up to 450. Um, the staff team was 10. Now it's up to 25. And we had 16% women uh, enrolled every year. Now we're up to 52% in this year, 50%. Wow. Year. And the leadership team in terms of women managers were maybe about the third of the team. Now we're just over 50%. So I really feel like systematically I have been able to live my values for better or worse in the work of building We Think Code. I've been able to look at the things that worried me, things that bothered me and say, well, on this patch of earth that I have influence and in some instances control, how will I wield that power um, to try and see if the world that I dream of is possible? And along the way, have pulled in so many partners and so many people that have poured value into it so that the sum of We Think Code is bigger than each of our individual contributions. So building this community of people um, that then pour into it and then my vision becomes just a part of a bigger thing. You know, and I, I think that's, that's my greatest achievement um, in life. And I guess maybe... A close friend of mine often says it takes 25 years to be an overnight success. And so <laughs> I think there are things that will be outwardly manifest in We Think Code that people will celebrate, where for me, I also celebrate the many little steps, the micro decisions, the you know incidents of courage, of perseverance that it took for the overnight success. So I celebrate as much the overnight success as I celebrate the courage, the attitude, the choices, the the presence of mind, the counsel I received in getting there. And I'm, I'm so, so very proud of it. I'm so proud of the team. I'm proud of the students whose journey I've been able to influence. And yeah, it's it's been a labor of love. I, I can imagine because I've, I've been part of, of um, um, a volunteer organization in Belgium uh, for Code Dojo where actually in my home city, I was trying to also work and, and having more girls joining in because this is for for little children and we were able to to get to uh 50 percent of, of girls most of the time but not all of the time but we were unfortunately not able to have enough coaches uh women coaches because it was really hard to convince them um and and yeah so this is i i know how hard that can be to reach out both for the teacher part as for the for the student parts and uh, it's a lot of yeah I, I recognize all the conversations I had to do with parents to convince them. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, and, and unfortunately, mostly uh, the fathers that I had to convince that, yes, your daughter might be interesting. I had to actually, I asked questions to, to a little girl when I say, okay, where you, because she, so, so a boy comes, and this is a, something I've, I've lived multiple times that a boy comes to, to learn to code and behind is a little girl. And, and so I just, naturally ask would you also be interested and i see a big smile and behind that girl is a father that says no it's not interested to her so the smile goes away and and so ask are you sure because little girls we, we have a few that are liking again a big smile father no no i'm sure i'm like yeah 
dad, look at your daughter. <laughs> uh, of course, I, I, I cannot say it that bluntly, but I, I keep repeating that story multiple times because yeah. it it's usually is um, the parents that don't, don't always realize it. Uh, how yeah how we think a little bit like what you said earlier on we live with with some ideas in life from this is more male this is more female and well if you look at at how it started with the very first programmer roles that were were women and and There's now somehow <laughs> exactly and and now not yeah so it's 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 insane now i have to admit i also made a similar kind of error um in a sense that at some point i i invited the 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 girls or the the friends of my daughter to okay are you interested to do and and one of the parents answers yeah yeah um our daughter can't come because she's uh, doing competitive, um, what was it, quad ri riding or something like that. So really motorcycle at, at, I don't know, age 10 or something. And I didn't see that coming. So <laughs> I had to admit for myself that like, oh, okay, I somehow in my brain, that was also something that was, that was not clicking. Even if I was trying to convince uh, parents that... Uh, so I have I had to admit myself <laughs> that even there I, I made similar kind of uh, attribution errors, which uh, which is also not nice. So it was good to to realize that. Um, anyway, this isn't about me, but I, I really wanted to say that, sir, because I know how hard it is, and I know how hard it is in in everywhere. Um, and similar kind of things is in, in healthcare. We have the same kind of thing for having more more main, uh, male. Uh, people, so it's it's not just uh, in one part of society. I think we have it in multiple parts of society. But it's really important to make that effort and to really make it and show it that hey, this is something that is technically possible. There is nothing wrong with the people's brain. People, it's just the same thing, and and it's much more an attitude and much more that somehow in our brains we think it's it's not. Uh, and not correct and so i'm really happy that you were able to do that both on the teacher's side as on, on the student side so definitely that's something that you should brag about and should uh, should be really proud it's um well let me see i, I have i i hardly never use it let's try yeah <laughs> Thank you. I, oops yeah, sorry, I, I I couldn't resist because I think it's it's important. Okay, let's let's move to that next question. Do you have any personal agility tip to share? Anything that you you do or that you think it's important for people to learn? I think the the personal tip that's really been central to my agility journey has been beginning with the end in mind. So in this construct of what is the difference between being agile and being indecisive? right, is essentially, in my view, agility is about understanding what outcome you're seeking and then being flexible in approaching the goal. Knowing when to be flexible and being comfortable with the need to experiment, I feel like it becomes easier when the end goal is clearer. Because when the end goal is clearer, it's easier to say, well, if I'm trying to end up there, What's the trajectory I am on? Is it pointing to where I'm trying to end up or isn't it pointing? How confident am I? How much do I know? So in, in, in my experience, servicing the outcome is what's central to agility being effective because agility is about adapting the specifics of the course to still achieve the essence of the outcome. And what I found with teams sometimes is it's the other way around. Agility becomes about particular rituals, about doing particular things. We, you know, we pair program, um, we have a stand up. We there are all these um, rituals, and the rituals are there to serve an outcome, not that the outcome serves the ritual. And how you know when you can leave something that a really wise person has advised you to do is when you have a North Star to measure against and say, well, by my reasonable estimate today, do these things add up to me achieving the outcome? If yes, carry on. If no, be agile and be willing to shift course so that you, know, you can still achieve what you want in the end. And I think if someone could have told me that when I first encountered agile and software, 
that would have completely changed my mind. I would have spent a lot more time asking the question of what the outcome we wanted was than, you know... Certain rituals and, and keeping... Yes. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I'm a person who is very driven by um, patterns of behavior, repetitive, but I'm also the person who's come to realize that, no, um, sometimes those patterns aren't serving and they can be put away. Um, even though they make you feel safe, even though when things are unclear, they make you feel like you know what to do next, sometimes they're actually damaging and problematic. And being, I guess it comes back to that story around purpose, right? Key to agility is having a central understanding of purpose. Because if you understand purpose, then everything else becomes a movable piece that can be adjusted to serve the purpose. And that's where the power of agility is unlocked. Yeah, I really like that. For for yeah, when when you were talking, I I immediately thought for the first example you gave about pair programming. For me, pair programming is about knowledge sharing, about quality. And so, if for whatever reason a client doesn't want to do pair programming, okay, let's see how can we reach that knowledge sharing and that quality in another way without fighting. You should do pair programming, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's see in a different way. And and maybe at some point they will realize, okay, pair programming might help me, but but let's Let's not start with that fight because then we're losing a lot of energy instead of yeah getting to the purpose and getting more closely to, to the thing. That, I think that's the kind of uh, thing that, that you're looking for. Is it correctly? Absolutely, because then people can also then follow the rituals because you said so. <laughs> and so um, what you'll find, for example, with pay programming, there are times when an individual just needs space to grapple with something on their own. And they're not, they're so, so, so unsure that they just want some space. And forcing peer programming at the at that moment in time is not. Oops. Oh, why is Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Like, uh, I just got cut off with my network and then I couldn't get, get back in. Um, no, no problem. I think uh, what I was making was people can be dogmatic and follow a rule because you shared a rule. And then now, the original goal you had, so the, 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 the practice of agility, the appearance rather, let me call it that, the appearance of agility is there, but the true practice for the outcomes. So people are doing what, they, what you said they should do. Um, and sometimes even with good intention, everyone is doing what they think is the right way. And they need to be able to be like, we're trying really hard to do this thing this way. It's not getting us closer. And so I, I sometimes think frameworks are very helpful but they're never going to replace that sense of responsibility and showing up to evaluate where are we going why are we going there are we on track or are we off track and so to me agility is really about deciding on an outcome coming with the sense and experience of some practices but being opening to alter how you do things in service of the outcome that you signed up to. I'll sit down and officially agree that we don't want that anymore. Um, we want something different. And that's also agility. But you can't do that unless you're engaging with that motivation or that core purpose very explicitly to say, when we started out this journey, we had set out as a goal to achieve this thing. Now that we're halfway through, we have the courage to change our minds, <laughs> set a new path. Yeah, I, I really like that because indeed, it, 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 part of what you say also makes me remind of Shuhari, like when we learn something, okay, it's really like do it exactly as told because we don't understand anything, but the more we understand it and, and gradually I'm also thinking uh, the more we in the beginning explain why we do stuff, if we can focus much more on the outcome than on the output, it will work out. But sometimes in the beginning, people don't always understand what, why uh, why the why is. And, and so so sometimes it's good to then, then learn some of the, the practices, but we should very quickly make sure or we should at least always make sure that we explain that is really the outcome that we are after and, and really go back to, okay, why is that doing? And like you say, if that if there is a North Star, if there is a goal that is very clear, it really helps to, to focus there and it helps to, yeah. And then uh, something you didn't talk about, but I heard it also in, in other kind of ways that you're talking in this conversation is that if, if the goal is very clear, 
then if there is a bump in the road, it doesn't feel that hard because it, that, that, that goal is very clear. And if, if somebody doesn't want to do pair programming because that person wants to have time on its own, if, if, yeah, if, if it's not clear why we do that, he might, he or she might be rejecting the pair programming and might be completely, yeah, in, 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 in a way to avoid these kind of things. And when that outcome is clear, that person might think on its own, oh, or she might say, well, let, let's do this or let's do that because that will reach your same goal. And you might say, oh, okay, that that's, might be even better. So then we're again looking for that solution. So that, I really like that, uh, that kind of it's way actually, of thinking. It, everything you're saying reminded me of a almost random incident many years ago when I was working on a software um, development team with uh, a few colleagues that were Brazilian. And so they were... Their native speakers Portuguese, and then they, you know, on that team predominantly we communicated in English. And I definitely spoke no Portuguese, and so they were kind enough to always be speaking in English because uh, anything other than English that they spoke I wouldn't understand. And I remember we were having a, a, a technical difficulty, and the one guy was our user experience designer, and the other was our quality assurance uh, tester, and they were both Brazilian, and I was the only non-Portuguese speaker. And the one guy says. Nyari, could you give us a moment? I'm confused by this thing and I'm trying to talk to him about it. I just need to speak to him in Portuguese so that I can just download <laughs> what I need to say. And I was like, sure. And then they had this conversation in Portuguese and they went back and forth for a while. And then when they came to a point where I didn't understand any of what they were saying, but their body language seemed to be like they were back on the same page, they just gave me the summary. And I've been in situations where language has been used um, as a way to, to push you out, where people don't want you to understand what they're saying. And so it's, it's scenarios like that when, when you talk about agility, right, where if the outcome is understood, I am switching from a language that you can be part of a conversation to one that you cannot be because I need it to find and gather my thoughts. It's non-threatening. I'm done with that part of it. I'm ready to bring you back in. I'm ready to join. And there's understanding around the table, around everybody's motivations. Whereas what I found in my life experience is that sometimes we don't take the time to say that. Or like you said, we don't know. And we flash mm -hmm. our ignorance with overconfidence. Peer programming is the way, you know. Speaking a mm -hmm. language that he understands is the way. And it's like, well, not always. <laughs> sometimes I just need a moment in Portuguese to not have the added burden of translation to just give my brain a break and work through this complicated problem, it's not about you at all. <laughs> and mm. that's done. I know the best ways for you to also know what's going on. And so I think what I've learned over time is that that, that, that process of either being able to put down the North Star or declaring the ignorance and saying, we're not sure where we're going. So we're busy with these experiments to answer these questions so that we can then declare the intent and then we can go about um, with the methodology that can get us to the outcome. But there's something about, I think sometimes the corporate world and KPIs and bonuses and the, the pressure to show up certain that takes away the humanity, which we all share of uncertainty, of needing a moment, of not being able to explain if, to everyone why you want to do something, but just be like, guys, I can't kick this thing. I was up last night and it's bugging me. Can we just time box for a moment and go on this tangent, which might be a rabbit hole? And there's a very real possibility that I'm wrong because I'm not sure, but can we try? Th th there's something about the world we live in today that requires us to not be that human, to require us to be the, if you're the expert, if you're the professional, if you're the consultant, if you're the coach, you know the answer. And you know the answer to agile, which is like a bit ridiculous when you think what the literal definition of agile is. No one can know it. What they know is to learn flexibility so that when the moment arises, you've got a tool bag full of some tools and you have a willingness to try different tools onto you know, different problems. And so, yeah. I really like that example, and indeed, the, the sometimes even the best thing is to. Well, I, in in this same show, I talked to Linda Rising that uh, that says that gave an example that if you worked on something for five minutes with your active brain, it's for her. She says like 
at maximum I want to work on something actively is five five minutes and then I stop doing it and I let it go and I have the other part of my brain in the active work on it and so I'm not going to try actively solve it because I know the other brain is much better but that brain works in the background and I shouldn't try and if we work on it for one full hour it might be just a waste of time until you give that the other part of your brain and so you might just better off wandering and, and doing anything whatever except working on that thing and it's not because you're lazy it's actually because you know that the way your brain is working that will find a better solution by not trying to solve it the other part of the brain can actively work on it and and i knew that theory but just when i heard her say that oh maximum five minutes it's like what and it, it's, it's 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 completely logical if you know the theory and everything but it's like five minutes that's that's almost nothing and but is that's that, how our brain is working. thinking fast thinking slow yeah exactly I really that's just... because of linda rising actually she was um an opening keynote at a conference i spoke at and she talked about that and i had a similar experience with it this construct but then i remember now reflecting on it and thinking i think part of it is we were talking about life stages is that there's a stage in life where you're learning rudimentary things and mm. then there's a stage in life where the bank of information and knowledge and whatever increases. So even in that thinking slow, the wealth of resources that are back there is more than what's in front. Whereas when you're in like grade school and you're learning algebra, you know, you you you, you the concepts are this big. <laughs> and so Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but by the time you're solving for concepts that are that big, I think there's an inversion that happens. And then the problem is that we have gotten to where we are credentialized by algebra problems she was the top of her class and she passed the maths quiz so now what's she doing she's just sitting there quietly staring at the wall why are we paying her how much per hour <laughs> and so all these other externalities start to impose upon what internally we know um to be what our bodies need and so yeah that's 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 lovely because i actually learned that from linda rising as well and it's pretty awesome yeah, it's, it's, it's a similar kind of thing. So definitely uh, check out the conversation I had with her because she goes much deeper in, into some of these things. And it's, uh, yeah, it's very similar to what you were saying before. So I really like how these conversations are linked uh, in different ways. Okay, let's move to that next question. What is something, what, what have you learned about remote working? Well, let's start with the question. Did you do any remote working before COVID or, or did, is that only when, when you start doing that? I definitely did remote working before COVID. Remote working during COVID was felt different. <laughs> it yeah. was very imposed upon us. And like, it wasn't just the work that was remote. Suddenly your community circles were also pushed remote. So it wasn't, it, it, and then there was just the overarching doom and gloom of the moment. It was just a heavy time. And I think, yeah, it took me a while to realize just how much it, the, the the weight of it was sitting on me and it's I think I'm still coming out of um the pressure and the heaviness that's COVID. I've been a bit slow to snap back. Um but I think but it's still around. We're 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 recording this in January 2023 and and well the the numbers are, are going down and everything but it's not gone. Uh yeah. There still are people falling sick. There, I think in, in, in Belgium, there's about 1,000 people in hospitals right now. Right. Not that much. The, the, the numbers are really, really lower than before. But still, 1,000 people is not nothing as well. Eh? Yeah. And it was so it was a... So I almost feel like when we talk about remote working during COVID, I'm like, oh, my God, it requires 10 different bullet points under it to also <laughs> add the context. But what I did learn about that extremity of remote working is that too much of a good thing <laughs> is problematic, you know, mm. um, that there is a place for remote work, but there's a place for contact and there's a place for interaction, whether that's because there was remote work during COVID was alone, alone. It wasn't even remote work. Like you could go to a coffee shop or a shared workspace and maybe not be in the same room as your colleagues, but be in the same work as other people. So COVID made, it was almost complete remoteness where work was one category, if that makes sense. Whereas um, prior to that remote work was work. It was the only thing that I did uh, removed was the work. 
But I learned, and you know, essentially we work with um, young people from like low income households. And in the context of South Africa, just the, the complexity involved in successfully working remotely, which is there's the very simple things. Do you have a computer? Um, do you have electricity? Do you have data? And initially we were solving for those things. And then you solve for those things and you realize there's, there's a whole other layer. Are you in a house where there's a quiet room where you can sit by yourself and focus on your studies or focus on your work? Or are you in a very crowded housing situation or noisy housing situation where you can't get that space to operate? And then further than that, community matters. Um, when you work remotely, depending on the level of relationship you have with the people you're working with, when you're in the same room, just looking up and saying, hey, what do you think about this? Um, overhearing someone having a conversation and then just you know jumping in there and being like, oh, that's interesting. There's a very natural manner to communication when you're co-located. When you're remote, the thought that I'm struggling to study, I'm not sure why I don't understand how to do this thing, but I know it's hard. How do I pick up the phone to call someone and be like, hey, I don't exactly have a question, but I'm fumbling in the way that I could just say, do you have a moment and start scribbling on a whiteboard and someone could be like, oh, what are you doing there? And so forth. So there's this element of kind of organic, spontaneous communication that's harder to replicate in remote work environments. Or maybe it's because we were very dependent on a co-located environment to create it, that we had to go about very intentionally creating together time that's unscripted and without an agenda for opportunity to just find out that the next person needs something. And that's something that I picked up during COVID time because prior to that, my remote work was like hybrid, really. It was remote today, together tomorrow. So remote was more quiet time and working alone, limited interaction or very structured interaction. And then in-person was the more spontaneous stuff. And then COVID just like, that away. And so you had to, you had to really, and so what I'm hearing is that you, you, well, if you're, if you're physically together, you and, and me as well, we kind of learned a way to ask for help in, in a, in a way like, okay, could you have a look? Uh, we're in the remote situation. We haven't learned yet on how to basically ask for help without knowing where you need help for, because then it might feel like, why are you calling me? Well, I don't really know, but I'm stuck. <laughs> Okay, where are you stuck? Well, I don't even know, but it 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 feels somehow unease and and yeah, okay. And in in a physical moment, you might just go to a coffee uh, to have a coffee, and some a colleague is there, and you have a, a small little chat, and without asking for help, this person is already helping you. Um, and, and, and you that can is, read their body language. You can read that they're they're sitting in a way or interacting with people around them in a way where they might be oh, more yeah. receptive to me, whereas if I'm phoning you and I can't see what I'm, okay, so I'm stuck now, I'm sending a meeting invite, when are you available? Or I just randomly phone you, your mind space, I have no way of knowing where you, so maybe you're in deep concentration. So when I'm on the phone, you're very like business, like, hello, hi, how can I help you? And then I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, and, and the opposite is true as well. Eh? If I'm walking around in the office and somebody is struggling, physically their body language will kind of tell in most cases if if i know this person well enough i will see something's wrong and 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 yeah so then you can okay maybe can i have a chat or well whatever and that and then it it, it kind of helps and all of that falls away so we literally have to learn it in a new way to do that yeah it's um so thanks for sharing because that's something i think a lot of us we don't always realize um that this isn't and did you have do you have any um real tips on on how to deal with that what is there anything that you've learned on how it could help me or someone else is that is in the situation i think where possible now that it's you know you usually can do time together schedule time together the other one that i found works is the open line where mm. you could be sitting there working and i'm sitting here working and this is something that worked really well for me and in almost like we share space, even though it's not the same phys physical space. And even personally, my, my younger sister and I are very, very close. And for a few years, we lived in different countries um, 
and when we missed each other, we would do that. We would um, just back then Skype and essentially be busy with whatever and then just speak the way you would do if you were sitting in the same mm -hmm. house and suddenly you speak and the other one looks up and says what's going on or someone is working on a spreadsheet and makes a weird noise and then you giggle you're like what's up and then you and it's interesting because it's spilled over now we live in the same city 10 minutes apart our homes are but we have these phone calls that lapse into silence and i hadn't even realized we do that until my partner pointed it out that when i'm having a conversation with my sister on the phone and she's on speaker we, we're actually okay with stopping talking while the line is open. And then mm. when they say they just speak up. So the line is open to give each other access that we would have if we are physically co-located that we don't have when we're separate. And so he, he was laughing to my mom when he says, yeah, you know, your daughters like can be on the phone for 40 minutes and speak for 10. <laughs> and, <laughs> but when we were in these foreign countries and working in consulting and alone, it meant we were in each other's company in a much more natural way than I'll call you a two. Um, mm, yeah, I can, I can it, it, it reminds me of, of something I've seen. I, I think, well, I, I think it, I don't know if it was during COVID, but it was somewhere after COVID that started at least is I saw something uh, from NASA. So there was something that they aired of, of something that was happening in space. And so basically they, they, they had the line open so you could follow it on, on probably on YouTube. So something that happens, but basically one person was in space doing some repair stuff and basically it was also an open line the person was saying i'm going to do this and then the person on, on on earth was saying okay you are going to do that and whatever and they had the line opened and for us all to 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 follow but it was interesting because they weren't really talking but it was indeed a little bit like working out loud and just stating i'm going to do mm. this okay and so so it was a lot more scripted than what you are talking about but it, it does remind make me remind me a lot about that because it's basically the line is open you keep talking you have that conversation and but you're not always talking you might just be doing whatever you need to do but then state okay i'm going to do this and and somebody else says okay that this is this is the result or whatever and and that's yeah because if, if you're in space you're all alone there somewhere floating around and and so it might be good to to have someone lonely. around you and yeah it's a little bit lonely and well and it, it's similar to what you're saying if you're in another country or if you're in COVID. Uh, it feels really lonely when you were talking earlier on about COVID, like everything is around that and everything. Yeah, it felt it could probably be similar to when you're in space and you're really lonely and, and everything you do is, is really always lonely because, yeah, you're in space all alone. Well, maybe you have two or three colleagues, but that's about it. Similar as in your house during COVID, you have your partner, maybe a few children and that's it. Um, or whoever's living in your house, it, it might be other family members, but that you, you, all your friends or whatever, it's all remote. Your work mm -hmm. is all remote. Everything is there. So that there's a lot of similarities there. So, so thank you for sharing that tip because it's definitely something I, I think a lot of us, we need to learn. Um, I, I, I think it's, I, I see already when, when I see, look at my, I have a teenage daughter. So when she's, the way she's using her phone with video calls and everything, it, it, it reminds me a lot of that is that, okay, opening a phone and then doing homework and a friend on the other side is doing other kind of homework that is in a totally different class. But it's like a little bit like what you explain with, with your sister. You do something else, but, but both of you are connected. And for me, it's like, no, I will just call a person and have a few things. And then when the conversation is over, then, then we close it. And, and, and that's it. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, definitely some things to learn there for me. So and thank I think you it's for sharing. Legacy from the cost of connectivity back in the Oh, day. yeah. Can oh, yeah. When I was in high school, just keeping a phone line open, it's like that was just not affordable. That, that was crazy. <laughs> but now the costs aren't like that. So you can connect literally differently. It's practical to do it differently than years ago. That would be right. So we've got a bit of that legacy as well, I think, of it's an international call. And so it charges at a certain way and do, 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 do. And now it's like, it's not like that anymore.
Well, and, and not just an international call. I do remember the conversations with my parents when I was like, I don't know, 15, 16, when I was uh, calling my, my first girlfriend a lot. And they were like, mm. hey, wait a minute, this is call. And this is a local call. But the, I, I do remember one of the first bills that my parents discussed with because it was way higher because I had a girlfriend. My, my sister had a boyfriend and we were like calling each other. Well, I don't know, maybe not every day, but enough more that the phone calls were much more expensive that that yeah. month and so yeah so the the message basically was yes you can call but not for an hour and and not every day and, and things like that so yeah. and you're right that that kind of stuck with me as like okay conversations are expensive and now we're here uh, we're calling over the internet and this is already more than an hour that we're talking and we don't care because even if it's There's time to wait cost. <laughs> exactly well we both have a cost that we pay but that's the same I'm cost flat. and um, <laughs> and it's a flat cost so that that's indeed it's a completely different situation uh and yeah it's it, it's hard to and that's yeah I, even if i mentally know that i yeah it we still need to to shut off that part of the brain like no it's okay we can just do that kind of conversations thank you for bringing pointing that out because i didn't realize that that i i still need well that software is still somewhere installed in my brain i need to deinstall <laughs> it because it's <laughs> look decommissioning it's, uh, software we all know is the hardest thing <laughs> Yes, and especially if it's about money, it's uh, everything that we learn about money when when we're young. It's uh, yeah, it, it's hard to 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 decommission. I definitely agree with that. Okay, I want to move to that next part. Is there a book that you want to talk about? Uh, it could be recently or another book. Is there something that uh, that you you want to talk about? The Systems Bible. I feel like it changed. And my that's life. The, this one. Yes. Right. Yeah. It, it changed, and I'm a person who's like, you know, read a fair bit about systems thinking and Donella Meadows and, you know, but this book, you know, the, the way it talks about how to make systems work, the way it talks about the unreliability of assuming that a small system, um, a larger system is a small system at scale, as opposed to mm -hmm. seeing all the points of failure that scale introduces um, that don't exist in a small system, you know. Um, I think it, it, it's an incredibly powerful book, especially if you're leading. For me, that I think that's what was powerful about it is um, the way my confidence had taken a knock. You get things to work in the small, and you're like, okay, so now we've proven the model. Let's scale up the model. And then suddenly the model that's at scale is kicking up all sorts of errors everywhere. And I'm like, I don't understand. I, I did the experiment. <laughs> I made it work, <laughs> cleaned it up and now doing it bigger and it now falls apart. And then feeling like, okay, so I don't know what I'm doing at all. <laughs> and so I should not be allowed to take, make any decisions. You know, that's a, it's a bit dramatic way my personality is. When I read this book and started to understand how scale in and of itself introduces variables. And so the, the variables you are managing for at a certain level of scale go away. And systems are designed to, you know, approach entropy. And so your job is to try and keep them alive, but they're really just trying to fall apart. And that's... <laughs> so if, if you walk in, because the gap between expectation and reality is really where despair is born. Um, if you walk into the world expecting that systems are, you know, it's like the same concept in economics of the reasonable man, only to discover that man is not reasonable. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a similar thing with systems. Systems are predictable. And if I set them up correctly, then they will work. And then when I scale them up, they do the same thing that they were doing with 10 at 100. If I just like give it computing power. Alas, no. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's trying to break down. And if you walk in with that expectation, then the way you manage for fallout is how you build resilience, is because you manage for things that are going to fall apart, as opposed to trying to go crazy building things that never break. Build things that you know will break, and how do they, in breaking, not destroy the universe? That's a, it's a very different attitude from one that says systems are resilient inherently and they will do what I told them to do. It turns out they are cranky toddlers. 
Yeah, and, and for everyone who has uh, has children, they, they we know that uh, toddlers are yeah, it's a completely different age than than uh, a very small child. Where basically you can control everything because that to that little baby cannot touch anything, and the toddler wants to go everywhere, and that things fall apart. Zero is a danger. There's like yeah, exactly. no the only one corner of this big room is danger. The toddler will like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they, they know it and they will focus on it. Uh, and and the bigger children are, they, they will they will find other kind of ways of, of trouble. Uh, and and yeah, so gradually we learn that the, the system is and and we need to we need to let go in in a sense indeed, like finding ways how can we avoid that. Uh, we cannot remove all the danger from a room, but we can definitely learn how to do that uh, and, and deal with it. And it's a little bit like, yeah, you, you can just hope when they fall that they learn how to fall instead of avoiding them to fall. Um, it, it's like learning to walk. You cannot teach. Uh, nobody can learn how to walk without falling down, but you need need to kind of be resilient that if you're almost falling that you figure out how to to push get back or when you fall that you can get back on your feet instead of avoiding to fall uh, yeah. and, and that's the thing uh, and that yeah I, I think a lot of that is, is true for the systems um I, I really like the metaphor that you said we don't want to to make it impossible to break. No, we need to be sure that when software breaks or whatever, that it can restart and, and whatever. If, if, if you imagine, I always like that the metaphor is that um, we have uh, spacecraft in the air for, I don't know, decades already. And, and, and at the same time, my computer is not able to be running for, for 10 days without rebooting. But there is somewhere a space station uh, or whatever a rocket that's been going on for for decades of course that computer reboots automatically because they build in some stuff at, at every time it's rebooting and it it's it, it's 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 getting automatic done not by there is no problem no it knows how to reboot itself and to solve kind of the problem or we hope that we it will solve all the things until at some point it won't because something happened that we didn't think about Exactly, I, I really like that, uh, and so that's that's definitely a good book that is that is interesting for people. I I've learned a lot about system thinking, but I haven't read that book, so it's definitely going to bump on my my list because it's uh, it seems to be a very important book there. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really cool one, and it's it, the way it's written is hilarious. So it's a very enjoyable book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just it's it's got a lot of kind of dry humor in it, so I I, I enjoyed that aspect of it as well. Oh, that's that's good to know because indeed system thinking can be something very dry and boring. And I've, I've yeah, I have to admit that I have a few books behind me about system thinking that uh, I tried to read two or three times and I gave up until I found a better book. And so yes. it's not that kind of book. Okay, that's that's good to know because indeed it's uh, yeah, these concepts are hard to grasp. So it's good that there is some humor in it that that makes it. Uh, yeah, easier to read. I want to move to that next question. And for me, that's one of the most interesting questions. What's a question that uh, that I didn't ask and what do you think that I should ask you and, and what's the answer? Um, yeah, I think you should ask me about ChatGPT. <laughs> hmm. it's, it's raging controversy right now. Um, so tell me about it. How do you feel about it? Have you tried it? Yes, <laughs> I have. Hmm. And I've been equal part excited and scared. And hmm. I can understand why it's um, bringing up a lot of controversy. But ultimately, what I think about it is I think it's a mirror of us. I think people may sometimes think of computers and then consequently AI as this... Um, evolved thing from the future, which to some extent the computing and the technology we're using for that is from the future. But essentially what we're seeing is what data about the way we live is online played back to us. So mm. it's, no one is thinking of it as a mirror. It's a, it's a mirror of what we collectively have gathered and, and put out there that that bot can, can, can access, right? And so how we engage with it is an interesting question of, so is this what we're busy with? Is this what we collectively think? Or what are the biases then in who's controlling 
conversations online, who's controlling what information is available, where are the big gaps? Because now when we look in the mirror, we don't feel representative by, represented by all of what's there. And so it's bringing back an issue around equity and access um, to digital technology and representation. So essentially all these same interesting conversations we're having in the real world are showing up in AI. And I think that's a part of the conversation I'm not hearing. There's a lot of interesting parts of the conversation that I'm hearing, but the part of the conversation around what does the things that it's reflecting back to us say about all the choices we've made about access and representation and expression now, and these ethical conversations that have seemed maybe a bit woo woo out there for the few people involved in the Google ethics debate, um, Dr. Timothy Gebru and them, it seemed like it was distant from all of us. But what this is showing is that no, it's it's now here. A lot of people you're interacting with, a lot of material you're consuming is just a, a crunching and regurgitation of what's already out there. And does it represent us all fairly? Um, and what do we want to do with that? So that's that's something that that's a rabbit hole I'm in right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, I, I think I think it's an interesting thing. Like you say, what, what's the information that it finds? It, it's um, it's also interesting that when you ask chat gpti uh, some kind of question that you don't know where where that information is coming from so it's hard to verify if the sources are correct or not just by um by test i i tested i think about a month ago i asked about myself so just like we sometimes google ourselves i says okay who am i or something like who is and then with my full name and the very first time i i did it i got an answer that was kind of correct not completely correct because it, it says i was a founder of a um of a, a conference that I was actually a very active participant, but I was never a founder, was never an organizer. But it, but I know a lot of people in Belgium think I'm part of the organizer. So in that sense, I'm not surprised that somehow that is probably, like you say, it's found that on the internet, and and so it's this. Um, the interesting part for me is, and that comes back to what's the information it's fine, is that then there was an update somewhere, I think at the beginning of January, Microsoft did an update, and then I, I did the same thing, and it didn't know me anymore. So that was interesting. Now I'm deleted. <laughs> so now it doesn't right know me. Right to be forgotten. <laughs> in, a sense, uh, in a sense, but at the same time, I have a, a niece that is actually much more known than me in, in, in her world. And when I asked about her, that information information was all based on my knowledge and totally nothing to do with her so that was completely wrong so that was interesting to just to compare a little bit things and say okay that yeah where is that information coming from and, and what does it mean and like you say what's the information where does it get the source how did it get it and 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 how could you verify and can you and well you, there is a way to say this is wrong so that that's kind of good well it can say it on the full block not on this line is wrong on this line is wrong but at least you can give some kind of feedback but it's really hard to verify where is that coming from or where is that coming from so i think there's definitely we need we need some more kind of things but it was interesting just as an experiment to ask about a few people and of course the big famous people they know and so that's how i got into that rabbit hole uh, trying to say and I've, I've actually tried it because um i needed to to talk uh, with someone for this show that i wasn't sure who that was and i said i was just playing around with chat gpti i said okay let's ask for this person as well and so i found something back and i was like oh interesting what what if i ask about myself yeah. and and then i then a few weeks later i wanted to show it to to someone else and then I, it couldn't find me anymore it was like oh okay <laughs> so and it's what, it's really what interesting about this is that people carry a sense of computers as being very clinical and objective. Mm -hmm. And I yes. worry with AI that that bleeds in to how people interact with information. And so I think we're entering, and at the same time, it's very exciting, the ability to collate this level of data. If you think of in areas like medical diagnosis or whatever, there's a potential for this thing to be really powerful, but there's also the potential for this thing to be incredibly dangerous. And well, it, it, it's based on the data, like you say, and, and like we already know that a lot of data, well, a lot of things that doctors know uh, is based on research that is more done on male than on female. So already a lot of that, 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 that really doctors know is, is 
wrong in a sense or not complete at least and if that data is now put into into these systems and that and i'm just talking male female it's even worse if you compare white and and black people and and then it's that there's a lot of that that's really becoming dangerous and i really like that you ex pick the example of health because if you look back at how my parents talk uh think about a doctor for them a doctor is like okay this is a highly educated and that doctor is always correct and always know it no that doctor has some knowledge based on on the world but but that doctor was also maybe educated 20 30 years ago so maybe this this person didn't re-educate every 10 years and so mm -hmm. some of that knowledge is i i my i I, mean, I like that example because my mother um she was teaching in um for nurses and one of the things that she once told me is that every two to three years they were giving her different kind of uh, things to say okay if people have this then you have to do this and then there was a certain i don't know it's not really a medicine but there's a certain thing that they had to say you need to do this when this happens and then five years later they say no you can no longer do it because we have learned something else and so if of course you are educated as a doctor or a nurse in a certain situation and then you didn't relearn things like four or five years later we knew that well maybe that medication is not as healthy as we thought it was and now we have a better one uh, and okay the good thing is we can probably much quicker re-educate uh, a chat gpti because we can just feed it a lot of data but it still is based on that data like you say it is very dangerous to just consider it always correct it's, and there's um, an interesting scary point of the intersection around the data when you look at what's happened with social media and the algorithms and the pref preference of certain kinds of dialogue because not because they're true not because most people are interested in them but because they they, they drive clickbait and yeah. i've seen this as creating a lot of surging in hate speech which then presents and how do you now correct for that when you've got AI and it's gathering data, how do you correct for the fact that the reason why there's an abundance of this activity around this issue isn't because it's you know prevalent or it's the right thing, but it's because someone was trying to make ad driven, you pushed that forward and then and then and then. So we're starting to see this continuous cascading and intersecting problematically. Um, that's got to do with uh, essentially the traditions around data and data access and um, digital technology and so forth, but it just has the, the capacity to amplify bad things so rapidly and scarily that, yeah, I've been in a rabbit hole reading more and trying to understand more. And what is the, what, what is the ethical point around this? How do you even regulate? Um, and it's, it, yeah, it's, that's what's on my mind right now. It, it it makes me think about a book I read, I think, four or five years ago, that's called the, um, uh, what was it called again? The Weapons of Mad Destruction. So, mad as mathematician. And, and there was a lot about data. And, and I don't know if it was already AI, but it was a lot about data and, and how data could, well, show like, okay, there is some data that says this is a place that is dangerous. So, because of that, you need more police controlling. But, of course, because you have more police least controlling we find more crimes and then it's, it's self-fulfilling prophecy and so anything you put in there it gives you something and it uh, i had a conversation not so long ago with, with my father about that about um how's it called um back uh years ago in in education at some point there was some study that says we, we're going to see who are the smart kids in, in the school. And so uh, basically random, they said, this is a, a child who has a high IQ and not a high IQ, but they did it randomly, but they didn't tell the teachers. And they tell the teachers, this is a smart kid and this is not a smart kid. And when they look back the year later, indeed, the, the children that they said they were smart, they had a higher IQ than, than and, and vice versa. And it was just based on, on randomly uh, yeah get information and because these teachers thought hey this is a smart kid they were putting more attention and if somebody who was called not smart didn't know it the teachers were like yeah that's normal he's not smart yeah, or she's not smart yeah. <laughs> exactly and and because of that they get paid more attention to the smarter ones who became smarter and then 
that that that's that's similar to what we see or what we can risk to seeing in in AI and and stuff like that. So indeed, it's a very interesting uh, debate and a very interesting thing to to worry about. How do we create the world for the future? Because we can basically we can create it in in very good or very bad ways. Like you say, the clickbait gave a lot of discussions and it's it's very tempting to go into that because this is better and whatever yeah, yeah. but it's also another human being on the other side that for whatever reason might have an id that i don't share that doesn't make that person dumber or or, or me smarter but it's very tempting to think that i'm smarter because i have the right id <laughs> and it's uh, yeah <laughs> It's, it's it's very interesting. And so, yeah, this is definitely a lot of uh, debate. And it, it would be interesting to indeed see this conversation back in five to 10 years and think, wow, okay, we moved so much more <laughs> yes. and, and different kind of things. That's also why it's important not to make big declarations, right? <laughs> and well, <not> the <laughs> Or or make them and and learn from it because I, I'm I, like you say it, it's okay to to learn from it as long as we realize oh we learned something and as yeah. long as again other people don't say well you once say this and that means well I I have the right to learn yeah uh, or at least I hope I have the right to learn at least that's I give myself the right to learn and, and to change ideas. Um, I want to move into that last question about who do you think I, I, I should ask next? Oh, I need a bit more time on that. Um, let me, can I get back to you on that one? I haven't figured anyone out. But oh, I thought you, I, I thought you had a name. Uh, if no, I, I didn't. The one I had, I think was, um, you had said that you needed someone outside of South Africa because you were getting quite an influx of. Yeah, that, 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 that well. The, 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 indeed, that is that is true. That uh, if you look back, I, I, I've closed Google Maps right now. But indeed, if if I would look back at, at Johannesburg, I have a lot of people there at at this point. Indeed, um, yeah. so that is that is something uh, I wanted to have a little more more diversity, and uh, so that that's why. So I, I that's why I was hoping that you indeed. Uh, had some other people that you yeah that were for you inspiration or one way that you thought might be interesting to to talk to. Okay, no, I'll I'll give it a bit more thought and then I'll share a name as soon as I have. Okay, that's that's perfect. That's uh, fantastically well. Um, anyway, um, for us, if we, I'm really happy about the time that you spent already now. Um, if people want to reach out to you, what would be a good way to to reach out to you? I think lately LinkedIn, <laughs> before I would have had a long list, now LinkedIn <laughs> is primarily where you can find me. I'm also on Twitter, but I just haven't been watching that account as much. And LinkedIn is primarily. Let's say that Twitter these days is a little bit tricky on where it's going. So indeed, in the last interviews, I didn't add Twitter links anymore or didn't prepare the Twitter <laughs> links because by the time things go out i don't even know if twitter will be around or if we dare to mention twitter that's indeed yeah. something that I'm, is i've cool. almost reduced my footprint i'm on linkedin now and that's where you can find me it's a, a lot of recognizing anyway i i want to thank you for your time because it's it's been a wonderful uh fun conversation a little bit all over the place which is the goal for me is to learn a lot about people that I haven't met and, and learn about uh, different kind of things. So, so thank you for your time because it's been, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a fun time and I've learned a lot both about your country of origin, about uh, where, who you are and how you grew up. So it was been, uh, it, it was a fantastic time. So thank you for that. Thank you so much for having me. I love the conversation. Thank you for watching Who's Agile, where the stories of agilists come to life. I hope you liked today's interview. Subscribe if you're not subscribed and want to get to know other agilists.